Okay, we're going to talk about the ventricular system of the brain and answer the questions, what are the ventricles of the brain and what is CSF, where is it produced, and where does it flow? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So the ventricles are cons consist of the following, lateral, two lateral ventricles, a third and a fourth ventricle. Let's talk about each one of those, okay? So here we're going to do this through a lateral view of the brain and this is the brain and then we've ghosted as if we're Superman looking through and we can see those ventricles from a lateral view and then this is the same brain except in a coronal section from an anterior view, okay? So the lateral ventricles are paired C-shaped chambers in each cerebral hemisphere, okay? So there's one C-shaped lateral ventricle on the left, and there's the other one on the right. And then if we look at the coronal view on the right side, there in coronal section is the lateral ventricle. On the left, there's the other lateral ventricle. There's two of them, which is first and second, it doesn't really matter. There's just two lateral ventricles, which is why we have a third ventricle. It's the largest out of all the ventricles, so it's far bigger than the third and the fourth ventricle, and it's below the corpus callosum. So in this coronal section, there's our corpus callosum. It's right below that large commissure. Then there's the interventricular foramen of Monroe, and it's the communication between the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle. So there's our lateral ventricle. Shing! There's the interventricular inter foramen going into the third ventricle. So we look on the coronal section, there's our two lateral ventricles, shing, they're the paired interventricular foramina going into the third ventricle. Then the third ventricle is in the midline, it's a narrow space between the left diencephalon and the right diencephalon. So in the coronal section, there's one diencephalon, there's the other diencephalon, and there is our third ventricle. So we, there is our diencephalon in this lateral view, and the thalamus and the hypothalamus are on either side. The third ventricle is what is in between the thalamus and hypothalamus on the right and the thalamus and hypothalamus on the left. The thalamus and hypothalamus and the epithalamus together are what are called the diencephalon, the inner brain. Then there's the cerebral aqueduct. It's also called the mesencephalic aqueduct, and it's also called the aqueduct of Sylvius. So I'm going to keep calling it cerebral aqueduct, but those other two are used in medicine as well. It's located in the midbrain, so it connects the third and the fourth ventricles. So there's the third ventricle, there's the cerebral aqueduct, and there's the fourth ventricle. So in the coronal section, there's the third ventricle, there's the cerebral aqueduct, and the midbrain all on either side, and there's the fourth ventricle. Um, and then the fourth ventricle is located between the pons and medulla and the cerebellum. So there's the pons and medulla anteriorly, and there's the cerebellum posteriorly, and outlined there is our fourth ventricle. And then in the coronal section, there's the cerebellum, and then outlined there is our fourth ventricle. So let's do that again, except let's just look at an anterior view. Those two things that look like ram's horns, those are the lateral ventricles. There's two of them, and they then, through the interventricular foramen, give rise to the third ventricle between the two diencephalons. And then the third ventricle, through the cerebral aqueduct, go into the fourth ventricle. Now, something I want you to observe is that CSF is coming from the two lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, and the only way into the fourth ventricle and then into the subarachnoid space is through that cerebral aqueduct. And so if you block that cerebral aqueduct, all the CSF in our two lateral and the third ventricles gets blocked and occluded. Then the fourth ventricle communicates to the subarachnoid space through these two lateral ventricles, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go shing and separate this brain in half, remove this hemisphere, and then look in that view. So this is going to be a sagittal section through the brain through a medial view. And there's our corpus callosum. Bef below the corpus callosum is the lateral ventricle, which communicates via the interventricular foramen with the third ventricle. And the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct communicates with the fourth ventricle. Now the fourth ventricle communicates with the subarachnoid space. So how does that work? Well, before we get into that, there's three questions I want us to answer. Where does CSF come from? Where does CSF flow? And where does CSF drain back into the bloodstream? Let's go through each one of them. So the choroid plexus produces CSF. By then, it basically filters blood plasma into the subarachnoid space, and so it's got many components of plasma. And this is what enables the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, to float. So the choroid plexuses are located in each ventricle. So there's the choroid plexus in the lateral and the third ventricles, and there's the choroid plexus in the fourth ventricle, okay? And the 
then the flow goes like this. So CSF from the choroid plexus and the lateral ventricle flows through the interventricular foramen and joins with the CSF from the third ventricle choroid plexuses, and they all flow down the cerebral aqueduct, and they join with the CSF produced by the fourth ventricle choroid plexus, and this is how it's flowing. So what happens then is the fourth ventricle has these openings called the median aperture, singular, and lateral apertures, the median aperture of Magendi and the lateral apertures of Lushka. And those apertures were communicating CSF from inside the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. So there is a singular median aperture and there is one of the lateral apertures on the lateral wall on the right. And then you see the CSF flowing through that median aperture into the subarachnoid space. And then the subarachnoid space flows all around the outside of the brain. Again, flowing up until you come to these things called arachnoid granulations. And the arachnoid granulations that are filtering plasma from, uh, filtering CSF from the subarachnoid space into the dural venous sinus, okay? So there's our arachnoid granulations, which filter that CSF into the superior sagittal sinus, which is now back into the bloodstream. Let's do it again through this coronal section. So there's the subarachnoid space, there's the arachnoid granulations, and that is the superior sagittal sinus in a coronal section. Now watch CSF in the subarachnoid space flows and then flows into the arachnoid granulations and filters through to enter into the superior sagittal sinus. And that is how CSF gets from the subarachnoid space into the superior sagittal sinus. Where does CSF come from? The choroid plexuses. Where does CSF flow? From the lateral ventricles through the interventricular foramen, third ventricle, uh, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, and through those apertures into the subarachnoid space. Not to forget that the subarachnoid space also flows around the spinal cord. So when we look at a cross section through the spinal cord, shing, the spinal cord is also floating in CSF. And then where does CSF drain into the blood? Those arachnoid granulations drain CSF into the superior sagittal sinus. All right, now CSF's volume in adults is about 150 milliliters. So here's a can of Coke. It's less than half of a can of Coke. That's how much. So not a ton of CSF through the subarachnoid space and inside the ventricular system. CSFs are replaced about every eight hours, and we get about a half a liter, 500 milliliters of CSF is formed each day. Now CSF cushions the brain and spinal cord and gives buoyancy to the brain and spinal cord. And the brain has a consistency almost like oatmeal, like jelly. And so the CSF gives buoyancy so the brain and spinal cord weigh like almost nothing. It reduces the, the weight of the brain and spinal cord by like 97 or 98% and it cushions it. So if we look at just the coronal section and there's the brain and there in blue and inside and outside the brain is the CSF and then there's the skull, you can see how the how the CSF buoys up, gives buoyancy to the brain, and helps cushions it from hitting the side of the skull. And that, my friends, is the ventricular system of the brain in a nutshell. Mm -hmm.